Oh, I do. I don't even have it here. Yeah. I don't know where it is. It must be in the... Jesus is calling. So, lesson 1.8. What do you learn about the Christian manner of loving God and loving neighbor from Luke 10, 25 to 42? Who would like to answer? That's both. That's both. Good Samaritan and... Martha and Mary. If you answered only using the Good Samaritan, you didn't pay attention to the citations. I'm embarrassed for you. Who could sum that up? What do we learn from Martha and Mary and the Good Samaritan about loving neighbor and loving God in a Christian sense? Someone be bold here. Who's looking down? Yes, John. I put um, that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. This was the emphasis in the parable of the Good Samaritan as to what a neighbor should act like. And with Martha and Mary, that it was wise to spend time listening to the Lord, take advantage, and take time for him. And that's how you even know how to love and whom to love. Good. Anybody want to add to that? It's well, a good answer. Okay, number two, we could probably, just, they, they wanted you to, you, that was skipped, but I'm just saying, they wanted you to look at the synopsis of the Lord's Prayer, to recognize that there are two versions, the longer and the version, and the shorter version. Um, let me ask, who is to pray the Lord's Prayer? In both, God, in both Gospels, both versions. And what's your evidence? We didn't, I know, I didn't ask you to look it up. Just what you know. What do you know? How does the prayer in Matthew begin? Our Father. Okay. And what, and what about Luke? Luke just begins Father. So does that, does that suggest something? Or is there something else, too? In Luke, the disciples ask, Lord, teach us to pray like, the disciples, like, like John's disciples, okay? So that there's that. Uh, it, it's kind of an, not a very good question. It's just, it's just asking you to dig around to discover that indeed the Lord's Prayer in either version is equally the, a, a community prayer, a corporate prayer. What shall we pray? Well, that's the list of the, of the, the first part of the, of the Lord's Prayer tells us that God's vision comes first, you know, our Father, our, uh, how be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Then we ask, you know, give us this, give us this, give us this. But we always pray first, your will be done, before we say, give me. Notice that? <laughs> we, the prayer is a wonderful model because it teaches you that first you start by saying, God, give me what you want. Here's what I think I want, <laughs> but I first asked you to give me your will. Notice that, and may your prayer life imitate that. Major differences, well, uh, you can, you know, that you could do, huh? Which version do you prefer? Probably the shorter one. If you think of all the times you wouldn't have had to have prayed so long, the rosary would be shorter. Okay. Number three. What do the three parables of John 15 say about God. Who wants to take a whack at that? Oh, this is not that hard, guys. Don't be so shy. I yes, uh, Bernie. Right, so there's the three parables uh, illustrate Jesus' particular concern for the lost and God's love for the repentant sinner. Very good. That says it. Somebody else got it? Got an answer they want to give? That's, that's good. I thought it was that hard. What implications do these parables have for how you act in community? Hmm. Who wants to tackle that? Well, I, 
I just said it, it's the right it's the right thing to do uh, to uh, to help the sick and, and the poor. You know, it, uh, should be part of what we do every day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the parables are very, chal- that's, they're challenging us to consider our, again, remember the Pharisees started it by complaining that Jesus spends time with tax collectors and sinners. And then in the response, Jesus tells these parables about looking for the lost, looking for the one who's, uh, and in a matter of speaking, the Pharisees were lost too. I mean, they're the, even though they're in a superior seat, they're not understanding who God is. One could argue they need compassion too, as much as, as the others do. Hey, Father, yes? Just a quick question. If, when you were talking about the Our Father, and you said, when you pray, um, ask whatever the Father wants, and you know, your will be done, and then ask what you want. Mm-hmm. And when Jesus was in the agony in the garden, mm-hmm. he had talked about. Um, Father, if you're willing to take this cup away from me, still not my will be done, but yours. And so he kind of flipped it and did it after. He flipped, I mean, in order of, in, in the prayer, but it's, it's, he's ultimately saying, God, you have, it's what you want first. I mean, I get, you're right, in order they come, but in the sense of the meaning, it's what God, you know, God's will first, my will follow. That's what Jesus means. He says, I want this cup to pass, but your will be done. So you get what you want first. So I think they say the same thing, even though they seem to say it in a different order. Yes, Bern. One of the comments on your father, the verse in there that says, forgive us our sins as we forgive the sins of others, is in fact kind of warning us that if we don't forgive others, he's not going to forgive us. Yes. Augustine calls that the, the most scary verse of the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> And, 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 and it's a hard thing to balance because generally, of course, Jesus is, speaks up for a God who, is initi- who takes the initiative to be gracious, but there's a threat involved in it too, that you shouldn't be so clever as to think, well, you know, God is like you know, your Dutch uncle or your, you know, that could be taken advantage of or could be assumed will always be on your side. There are things that are expected of us, yes. We who have. Okay? Four. How frequent, list how frequently the theme of the right use of wealth occurs. How many did you, how many different, how many different references did you see? 10? 15? Woo! Now it depends if you break one into two parts. But just no, I told you, in Mark's gospel, the only reference to wealth is the rich young man. That's the only time that it comes up. Remember, because again, Mark's community was in a, they were in the throes, I think, of a reaction to persecution. Luke's community, they live on Country Club Road. They're, they have houses with tiles. They're educated and articulate. Wealth is a problem for them. They don't think it's a problem, but it's a problem, Jesus says. So next year, now starting in December, we're reading Mark's gospel. Okay, so December 2020 is Mark's gospel. But December 2021 begins Luke. So watch out for your wallet. (laughs) I'll be after you. Okay. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> okay, so uh, for those of you who are watching online, Uni is asking, she's, she's reading Luke's version of the rich young man, who's an official, he's an official in this gospel, and Jesus, when the disciples, well, let's look at that text, what chapter 18 verse? 18, 18 to 
Okay, verse 23. When he heard this, he became sad. If Jesus says, give it all. He was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who have got great riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? So what are the people who are listening, what are they responding to? Peter? The law of retribution. They understanding is if God made you wealthy, it's because God loves you and you are to be blessed. That's, that's how the law of retribution works for them. And if the, if the guy in the ditch is poor, it's, well, he deserved that. I shouldn't help him. It comes up, actually, it comes up maybe not just in America, but it comes up in India. Shouldn't you help? Shouldn't you help the underclass? You know, if you help them, don't you mess up their reincarnation? In a caste system. You understand castes in India? Okay? There is, the, the, you, when you're born, because of who your parents are, you're born into one of four castes, and the lowest caste are the untouchables. But the belief in Hinduism is that you're learning something. You have to work something out. And if you live this life well, you'll come back as a higher caste. So if the wealthy people, if the top caste people, take care of the bottom caste people, aren't we just frustrating the God's effort to help them grow? Do you see the logic of it? Okay. I mean, that's, that's, that's Indian religion. But, but, but you see how it works for the sake of the rich. It, it's, it's convenient how it works for the upper, cla the upper caste. You know? So basically you're doing them a favor. By not, by not helping you, I'm helping you. Okay, by keeping my money and not sharing with you, I'm helping you get to heaven sooner. Okay, do you see how that works? Isn't that great? Huh? Yes, because they'll die soon. They'll die soon, and they'll come back, hopefully, as a higher caste. Well, there's a recent one criticized by some Hindu leaders for that, for messing with Messing up with their karma. Okay. Like feeding the bears in the, in the, uh, in the park. You know, you feed the bears, and they, don't want to, they can't help themselves, and they... Okay. <laughs> I don't think Jesus was talking about bears, but we'll go. Anyway, Jesus, so again, law of karma. Every time the law of karma comes up, or the law of attribution, Jesus just flips on it. Okay? He doesn't give us the answer, but he tells us that's not the answer. Good. But isn't that a burden for people who are rich? Yes. Yes, yes. Only for Christian rich people. If you're a pagan, you don't have to worry about this. This is what, never take up your cross and follow me. Who said this was going to be easy, huh? Who said this is going to be easy? All right. Um, let's see, did we do five? No. Did we do six? See, I have five we did do, two we didn't do. Oh, I mean, I had you do it. Number five, using the special L, the passages that are found only in Luke. Same thing you got here. What passage did you really like and find meaningful? Can two or three of you answer that? What, what, what's your answer to number five? What passage in the special L section did you find helpful, intriguing, and why? Yes? I think um, the first passage, the parable of the dishonest judge. The passage teaches the disciples the need of persistent prayer to keep faithful and have trust in God. Prayer is an important part of my faith journey. I know that God hears and listens to my prayers and that he acts according to his perfect plan and in his perfect timing. Very good, thank you. Somebody else? I did Luke 12 48. Luke 12 48, which is what passage? Uh, it's, uh, much will be required of the person entrusted with much, Woo. and still more will be demanded of the person entrusted Ouch, okay, what about that? Pretty blessed in this world, have to be uh, accountable for what I've been given and how I've used it. Okay. 
Great, good, good, excellent. We're going to mush on here, okay? We'll do a little bit more of lecture, then we'll take a break, and I'll do the last bit of lecture. We're up, now we're using our, our synopsis book again, huh? Because we've left, we've, we've left the section, it's still on, you're on. I'm having difficulty here. Give me a minute. So.